Okay, so we are recording. Um, before I pull up the slides, I wanted to uh, ask uh, and see if everybody can see the whiteboard. And also, I'm curious, based on your interface, if you can read this on the top right. I might be using the whiteboard a bit today, and so I wanted to make sure that the size and the clarity of the, the font was, was good enough. Can everybody read this? Okay, it's a little bit small. Okay, I might try and uh, write a bit bigger. I might use it a little bit, but if for some reason something doesn't come through clearly, let me know and we can switch to the screen. I'll probably hop around a little bit today given uh, what we'll talk about, but let me go ahead and uh, pull up the slides. Okay, so can everybody see the, uh, the announcement slide? That should be what pops up on the screen. Yeah, I can see it. Awesome. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, and one other thing to keep in mind, I know from your interface, uh, you can uh, hop back and forth between me on camera as well as the um, the uh, slide by just clicking. You sh I think I show up on the bottom. Uh, you can see me on camera. And if you click back and forth, you can uh, uh, hop uh, between the screen and between me. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, I want to discuss a, a couple brief announcements. Uh, first off, um, everybody uh, should have received a message on Microsoft Teams. Uh, I went ahead and posted that, I believe it was uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, the recording from yesterday uh, has been uploaded to uh, the Blackboard page, or sorry, the, the YouTube page, uh, and I provided the link to the playlist. The link is also on uh, course content. Um, I also wanted to mention, in case for some reason that I'm that, that I get a little delayed in uh, in uploading it, I wanted to show you where the recordings are available in Blackboard to you. If you go to Blackboard Collaborate, uh, and it's it's easy to to miss, but if you look in the top image on the slide, you should see where it says Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, and there's this uh, these three white lines. Um, if you click those three white lines, it brings up a menu, and under that menu, uh, you should find recordings. And so, you, the recording from the last uh, from the last lecture is there, and you should be able to not only watch it, but I also set it up. If you wanted to download it, you're, you're more than welcome to. So everybody should have uh, access to that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assign our first homework today. It'll be due on Friday, but as you're going to see, it'll be really, really short. Uh, and, and with that, I, I want to sort of jump right into what we're talking about today. Uh, if you remember last time, we focused on uh, discussing, uh, you know, what it is that we're doing in this class. We're, I mean, the, the name of the class is Structural Analysis. Um, I, I, might, I don't know if I specifically stated this last time, but I'm actually not the biggest fan of that name, Structural Analysis, because it implies that what we're doing is analyzing structures, and that's not technically true. What we're actually doing is analyzing these models that represent structures, okay? So before we begin doing that, we need to understand those modeling tools. We need to understand the, uh, the types of uh, uh, systems that we're analyzing and how they behave. And then what's really the main focus to, of today is we need to classify uh, those systems. And so what I mean by classification is really two things. We need to understand whether or not the system that we're analyzing is stable and whether or not it's what's called statically determinate. Um, and there are two, a system could either be statically determinate or indeterminate. Um, and uh, you might have not heard those terms yet, and that, that's completely fine. That's the whole point of the lecture today. But after today, you should have a pretty good understanding of what it means when a system is determinate or indeterminate. I'll go ahead and tell you that for the majority of the semester, we'll be dealing with systems that are statically determinate. Uh, and the reason why is you, you basically, you cannot perform indeterminate analysis without understanding the principles of determinate analysis. You have to start there first. Uh, but today we want to understand what that even means. What does it mean for a system to be determinate or indeterminate? And what does it mean for a system to be state? Um, so, uh, so with that, I want to jump right into it. And I want to start off by discussing the modeling tools that we use um, and specifically trying to focus on boundary conditions. Uh, and the internal releases that we see uh, in, in, in our uh, models that we're going to be analyzing throughout the semester. Um, so I want to focus on this. This is an image that kind of came from, uh, that, that I sort of ended Monday's lecture with. Um, 
What I have here on this slide is an image of a real life structural system. Okay, this is a roof system that might be, you might find either in a, a residential construction project or maybe a commercial construction project. Um, and you can see that the wood trusses that act as the framing for the roof. But we as structural engineers, we don't look at that when we are, are trying to design that roof. We look at what you see on the right. And what you see on the right is an analytical model that represents that roof. And, and really, it's just a bunch of lines, dots, and arrows. You see this triangle-looking thing at A and this wheel-looking thing at G. Um, but the idea is that those assumptions and the behaviors that are attributed to those represent the real-life behavior pretty darn well uh, of the, uh, the system on the left, the real-life uh, structure. And on, and on top of that, by making those assumptions and by simplifying the system to something like you see on the it makes the system able to be analyzed quickly uh, and, and, and effectively by an engineer. And ultimately, what the engineer needs is the response of that system in order to design it. For instance, if I'm looking at this truss, I would solve this truss uh, to maybe find, I don't know, the force in member, let's say DJ, that vertical one in the member or in the middle. And then that force in that member tells me, okay, is a two by four good enough? Maybe it not, doesn't need to be a two by four, maybe it be a two by six or a two by eight uh, or what have you. The idea is that those uh, assumptions and that, that simplification of that behavior is what we, is what we need to, to be able to effectively analyze it. And so what we as engineers do, and I mean, this is, you'll find this in every single uh, structural engineering project that, that it is that, that we do and I just have here an example of a three-dimensional bridge what we're doing with that three-dimensional bridge is we're taking a dimensional structure and we're simplifying it into what you see on the right and so most of the structural analysis problems that we deal with as civil engineers are two-dimensional problems uh, and they incorporate one-dimensional elements like I said the elements the, the members are just basically idealized as lines and the, the system is idealized as two-dimensional. And that gives us a couple of advantages. Uh, it allows us to get the results really rapidly and really effectively. It also allows us to simplify the process. I mean, for example, the, the use of uh, cross products and dot products and IJK and all that, that's really important to understand the, the principles that we're going to use in this class. But as a result, because we do this, we really don't have to use any of that IJK stuff in here. And a lot of the math that we do in here is, is pretty straightforward and, and effective for the design. But yeah, most of the, the models that we're going to be using are two-dimensional models. You know, you can see the truss, you know, goes along the X and Y axis, and the elements are just lines. So really what matters from a modeling perspective that you understand is not only the way that members are connected to each other, but also the way that the members are to the ground, okay? And so what I mean by members connected to the ground, I'm talking about boundary conditions, okay? So in terms of modeling a structure, boundary conditions are one of not the most, the most uh, important aspect that you as an analyst need to understand. And so, um, Basically, you know, in a nutshell, what do I mean by boundary conditions? Well, supports attach the structure to what I'll call the ground, okay? And our main components that keep the structure in equilibrium. That's what I mean by uh, boundary condition. Now, to explain what I mean by the ground, I've got here this image on the right. I imagine everybody here probably recognizes this. I took this picture on Monday. This is the canopy that uh, connects the uh, new engineering building, the old engineering building, just right outside here. Uh, and let's see, maybe I can use a little pointer here. Can everybody see my little hand pointer? Can everybody see that? Thank you. Good, okay. So uh, for instance, if I'm looking at, let's say this column here that's in the background and I'm focused on this point right here, uh, the boundary condition or the conditions I might want to uh, ask myself is, okay, I've got this column that's attached, uh, that's connected to the ground here. What of four forces am I going to see at this connection? And ultimately, that will help me determine not only the, the support reactions here, but the ultimate force in the column, which is what we'll, we'll be dealing with later. And once I determine the force in the column, I can then determine, well, how big does that column need to be in order to safely resist the load? And then they go and build it. Um, the other uh, aspect of support conditions, instead of the ground, it might be 
a, a structural element connecting to an adjacent element. So for instance, if I'm looking at, let's say this beam here on the top left, I might be looking at this beam and I might be asking, okay, what type of forces am I gonna see right here where it's not really the beam connecting to the ground, but it's the beam connecting to this column. And it's sort of like a hip bone connected to the leg bone type of thing. The beam connects to the column, the column connects to the ground. Uh, that and, and understanding that transfer of load throughout the system uh, is fairly important as well. But right now we wanna focus on the boundary conditions, the end conditions that we see uh, on our systems. And there's really three different conditions that we're gonna be dealing with in the vast majority of civil engineering applications and virtually every problem that we deal with uh, in this class. I'll turn my little pointer off. Well, I'll just leave it up. Okay, so uh, the first one is a pinned support, okay? So a, a pin support is a, a, a support that restricts motion in the X and Y direction, uh, but it allows rotation. And so basically a pin support will develop two reactions uh, at each end, but it will allow the system to freely rotate. Now, um, what I mean by that from a structural engineering perspective is that the, sit, the, the connection or the, the end condition is not designed to resist rotation. For instance, if you look at here at this image on the top, uh, the top left, uh, or sorry, top right, and you can see here I have this uh, eye shape, this cross section that's connected to the column. And uh, hopefully you all remember this maybe from mechanics, but if you have an eye beam, we call the top and bottom of that I beam, we call those the flanges. And then we call the middle portion, we call that the web, okay? And when, and later on, we'll talk about this in much more detail, especially if you all decide to take me for seal design, we talk about this in, in a lot of detail in there. But when you're designing beams, typically what you assume is that the web is what carries the shear, but the flanges are what carry the moment. And so, this particular connection where it's not connecting the flanges, we would basically consider that a pin connection. Uh, you know, it probably isn't gonna rotate very easily uh, if you, you know, grabbed it and tried to rotate it, but the idea is that because the flanges aren't connected, that connection is not intended to carry moment, it's only intended to carry shear. Uh, and there's a couple of different examples of that from what you see on the top right to what you see on the bottom right, which is probably the most literal interpretation of a pen connection. I mean, it's literally, uh, you know, a single pen. Um, now your textbook will use this symbol here that's on the bottom left. And I mean, it literally looks like a pen. Probably what I will draw in a lot of my problems uh, in class is a triangle. Like it'll, it'll look like a, a triangle. Whenever I draw an end supported triangle, I'm talking about a, a pen connection. So that, that's the symbol that I'll, I'll most likely use throughout the semester. Uh, a roller support, um, a roller support is, is a little different. Uh, rollers only restrict motion in the direction of the roller. Um, they can also develop, or so they also develop uh, uh, reactions in the roller's direction. Now, the symbol um, is a, a little, I guess, um, maybe deceptive. Usually what we use is a circle. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, when, you, when you draw it as a circle, a lot of times students think of it as a, uh, like, a, like a wheel. Uh, when we have roller supports, not only can you develop a reaction going upwards, but you could also have a reaction going downwards. So you could have a, a negative reaction going in the opposite direction. So we can't have roller supports with reactions going down. We just draw a roller just to uh, make it uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we do sometimes see negative reactions at supports like this, particularly when we're constructing bridges. Uh, as you're building the bridge, sometimes you can get uplift forces on one end if you got too, too heavy of a load on the opposite end of the piece of your girder. So we can't have reactions that, that are negative that, that act downwards. The, the best example I can think of uh, is, is a diving board. If I'm standing on you know, the end of a diving board, you know, that, that far, far pin on the end of the diving board is actually holding the diving board uh, down. Uh, the symbol in the book, sometimes the book uses this circle, sometimes it uses this little pin on wheels, uh, but again, the idea is that it only re uh, develops a reaction uh, vertically. Uh, one uh, point of terminology, and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna 
actually stop my share because I want to test this out and make sure everybody can see this. Okay, so everybody should be able to just see me now. So to give you uh, an example of, of a structural analysis model that we'll see throughout the semester, let's say that I have a beam, okay? And on this end, I have a pin connection. And this end, I have a roller connection. So can everybody make out those symbols? Yeah, I can see it just fine. I think uh, well, I, you're not full screen, but I can see you anyway. Yeah, I, I know what the, because, yeah. Um, so just so everybody is, is understanding, you know, this pin connection, basically when I'm looking at this structure, we're saying that this pin connection here, or this pin support, could develop two possible reactions, a vertical reaction and a horizontal reaction, and then this one here could develop one vertical reaction. Now, I'm, I'm drawing them upwards. Later on, we'll talk about, you know, why we draw them upwards and what happens if they're actually downwards and whatnot. We'll talk about that uh, in more detail uh, uh, later, but for, for the sake of discussion here, we'll just say they're acting upwards uh, and to the right. This particular model, we have a very specific name for this uh, in structural engineering. We call this a simply supported uh, 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 model. This would be a simply supported beam. We call it simply supported because basically what we're saying is that the ends cannot carry moment. Uh, for instance, if we were looking at this model here and we had fixed connections on the end, well, these fixed connections would not only uh, withstand uh, vertical forces, but they would also withstand moments as well. So this would be a simply supported beam. This would be a, a fixed ended beam. Um, most of the, and to give you some reality to this, most of the floor beams, let's say in a typical building, like definitely the floor beams in this building, the ones that are supporting the office that I'm standing in right now, they're all designed uh, as simply supported sections. So if I ever use the term simply supported, this is what I mean, either hinge or roller sections on each end. And also as we uh, progress throughout the semester, you'll find that the behavior doesn't really change all that much if I were to swap these. Uh, if this was the roller and this was the hinge. As long as they're simply supported, the beam is gonna behave largely the same way. Okay, let me go back to my slides where I was at. I think I was right here. Yep, so there's uh, pin supports, there's roller supports. Uh, lastly, we have uh, fixed supports is what I was mentioning earlier, and I'll, I'll typically draw those as just like an end stub with a little shade on the end. And fixed supports uh, have three reactions on them, and they have a force in the X direction, a force in the Y direction, and a moment reaction. And so those are gonna be for when you're uh, either like encasing your beam and your column, like you're actually physically connecting together, or you're, um, you're, you're connecting your web and your flanges for it to see if we were talking about steel design. And there are reasons why we would use simple supports versus uh, fixed supports in structural engineering applications. And we talk about that a lot throughout the semester, throughout this semester, as well as uh, throughout steel and concrete design. But the, the short answer is that fixed supports, the, the connections that, are, that, that go along with them, uh, tend to be a bit more expensive but as a result, the member can be a bit smaller. And so it's a little bit of a trade-off and it just sort of depends on the type of structure you're assessing, what forces you're seeing, the economy. And so it's a, it, it's a pretty uh, uh, large question to, to answer. And so you kind of, from, from an analyst perspective, you kind of need to, to understand both. All right, lastly, I wanna talk about internal releases. So as you're building uh, or, or designing a structure or analyzing a structure, sometimes what you'll find are points in the structure that relieve the response at a given location. The most common internal release that we will deal with through the semester is a hinge. So you're, you've got a structure and you've got a, a, a hinge in the structure. And what that hinge does is it releases the moment inside uh, the structure at that particular location. Um, let me kind of explain that on the board. Let me erase this a bit. And I'll try and give you the, the, the short answer as to why this matters from an uh, analysis perspective. So let me uh, stop this share. Okay, so everybody should be able to see me and I'll give you sort of a humorous example. 
Okay, so let's say for the sake of discussion that I have a simply supported section. Okay, and let's say that I am sitting on this. Let's say it was like a park bench and I'm sitting on it. And so this is the best image you're going to get of me. I'm, I'm not a very good artist. Okay. And let's just pick somebody out in the class randomly. Let's say uh, Miss Keaton Kong, and she doesn't like me very much, and she has in her hand the secret weapon of structural engineering, which we'll talk about a lot throughout this semester, which is, a, uh, I tend to joke that the secret weapon of structural engineering is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, because what we're going to be doing a lot when we're uh, conducting analysis is we're going to be cutting sections, okay? So let's say I'm sitting on this park bench, uh, and Kayla comes along, and she has a samurai sword or lightsaber, depending upon her preference, and she decides to cut through the, the uh, park bench right here, okay? Uh, a couple of things are going to happen, okay? First thing is going to happen is I'm going to be pretty upset, okay? Second thing is why am I going to be pretty upset? Well, the reason why I'm going to be pretty upset is because if I'm sitting on a park bench like this, I mean, imagine yourself sitting on an empty park bench, and you're on the left end of the park bench and you're the uh, you know, the only one on the bench and somebody comes in and chops the other end, you're going to fall down, okay? Now, think that out. Why are you going to fall down? Well, you're going to fall down because once you cut through the park bench, you release from the structure the ability to resist the forces going on inside the bench right here. So if I were to, you know, sort of redraw this and imagine, you know, here's the park bench and I only look on one side of that where I cut that section. So here's me sitting on the park bench. And this is where Kayla decided to chop through the bench. The reason why I fall down is because inside the park bench, before she decided to cut through the bench, there were unknown forces. There was an unknown force in the Y direction. There was an unknown force in the X direction. There was an unknown moment, okay? Any arbitrary time that you cut through uh, a section in, in a structure, there are, you know, at most three unknown forces at that particular point, okay? So when Kayla cut through the bench, she relieved those forces. So we actually use uh, section cuts sort of as a, uh, almost like as a thought experiment. We asked, well, if we were to cut through the bench, what were the forces inside the bench right here to keep me upright so that I didn't fall over. And so we use that structural analysis principle to do a lot of uh, analysis of the forces inside the structure throughout the semester. Now, here's the point. What about hinges, okay? What does this have to do with hinges? Well, imagine uh, instead of Kayla cutting through an arbitrary point, what happens if she were to cut through a point where there was a hinge? Well, a hinge is I mean, another name for a hinge is a moment release, okay? Hinges cannot resist moments. I mean, I've got here my, my office door right here. If I open my door, how do I open my door? I apply a moment to it, and it easily opens up, okay? I propose that whenever we cut a section through, we don't know what the force in the X direction is. We don't know what the force in the Y direction is, but we do know that the moment equals zero, Okay, and so hinges and internal releases in general sort of provide a, a, a nifty analytical tool for us to understand what's going on inside the structure at a particular point. They also have real life uh, reflections. So let me uh, let me go back to the slideshow. Saw a question in the chat. Yeah, I I, I know that I, I wanted to make sure that everybody was watching me though. I was afraid that that uh, that if if I if I didn't stop the share that it would that it would move back. Also, I, I learned that if I stop the share, if I make it if I make it a point to stop the share, then when I, when you pull back the recording, if it's not sharing something, that it, then the recording will show me. I, I learned that when I was. Uh, fiddling around with it over the week. I'm going to try and do that. I'm, I'm going to try and not do that as much throughout the semester, uh, but sometimes when we're introducing some topics, I might hop around a little bit. But yeah, I'm going to try and not do that as much. Um, <clears throat> going back to the, to the hinges, uh, 
not only do hinges provide an analytical tool to assess what we're doing, but they also have real life representations. Again, like I said, if you have a connection that uh, only connects, let's say, the web of, of I sections, but not the, the flanges, uh, you'll, it, it's only designed to transfer shear forces, so it, it acts like a hinge. You also find this in a lot of older bridges. This is an image on the top right of what's called a pin and hanger connection. And, and this was a connection technique that we used uh, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, it is designed to act like a, a hinge as well. And so when those members connect, we, we treat that uh, like an internal hinge. All right, um, before we get into classification land, I want to see, does anybody have any questions about just the modeling, the boundary conditions, uh, the determ or the, the internal releases, all that? Don't worry, we're going to have a lot of practice with this stuff uh, coming up real quick in the next couple weeks. All right, um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk about uh, structural classification. And what I'm really trying to answer are two things. I'm trying to answer whether or not a structure is stable and whether or not a structure is statically determinant or not. And those are two different uh, questions, but uh, after a few slides, I think you'll see it's, it's actually a really easy determination once you get the, uh, uh, the big picture. So let's go back to statics. Um, because a lot of what we do is built on statics. Now, when I when I did this uh, example here on the board, I, I sort of was saying, oh, you're going to have three unknowns. It's always going to be three unknowns, you know, force in the X direction, force in the Y direction, and, and a moment. But let's go back to statics, and let's, let's look at the big picture. So in statics, for any three-dimensional system, you have six equations of equilibrium that it has to satisfy. So um, you know, when you first start taking statics, the first thing that you deal with is statics of particles, so all the forces all meeting at a common point. And if all the forces meet at a common point, then you only have three equations, uh, the sum of forces in the X direction, forces in the Y, and forces in the Z direction. And that's, all, that's when they all meet at a common point. But as we know, that doesn't always happen. I mean, look at the park bench. You got a force down here, you got reactions over there, so they don't all meet at a common point. And that's why you introduce the concept of moments is because you can we deal with systems all the time where the forces don't meet at a, at a common point. Well, because, because what we do as civil engineers, we take uh, a lot of our 3D systems and idealize them as two-dimensional models, we can make that a lot easier. Instead of, so instead of having to deal with six equations of equilibrium, we only have to deal with three. The sum of forces in the X direction, the sum of forces in the Y direction, and the sum of moments uh, about the, uh, the, the system. So, uh, you know, if there's any one number, I guess you could say that like, wh like, what's the most popular number in structural analysis? It's three because the you know, three equations of equilibrium are what we're going to be using. You know, this entire semester. Okay, and so I, I want to, uh, you know, focus on that a little bit. Okay, so let's take a problem like this, and I want to sort of, you know, dig into this a little bit. This is like the first structural analysis problem we will do in this class, and we'll start doing these problems on Friday, okay? So let's take a look at this. I have a beam, okay? This is a simply supported beam because I have a hinge on one side, a roller on the other, okay? And so let's look at that hinge. The hinge is a, it has two reactions, in the X, one in the X and one in the Y, and then the roller only has one reaction. It has a reaction in the Y. So um, I have this table on, on the right of the slide, and I look at this system and I say, well, how many unknowns do I have? I have three unknowns, the A reaction in the X direction, the A reaction in the Y, you know, A sub X, A sub Y, and then B sub Y. So three unknowns, okay? Now, those are my unknowns. What are my knowns? What are my known quantities? Well, my known quantities come from statics. I have the sum of forces in the X direction, the sum of forces in the Y direction, and the sum of moments. So I have three unknown quantities. I have three known quantities. And so we can solve for all of our unknowns using just statics. We don't need any other information about the system. All we need is statics and we can completely solve everything. And the same thing applies if we're looking at, let's say, the internal forces in the structure. So I go back to the samurai sword or lightsaber and I have some system and I cut through it. It doesn't really matter what the loads are or what the reactions are, but if I'm interested in the internal forces inside that structure, I've got potentially three un potential unknown forces, a force in the X direction, a force in the Y direction, and a moment, and I use my three known quantities. Again, we can solve for all of those unknown entities using just statics. That's all we need. So I want to focus on that. 
systems where we can solve for all of the unknown elements using just static uh, equations of static equilibrium. And what I'm saying is this, if we can perform an analysis and all we need are those three equations, the equations on the top, so if we can perform our analysis and only use equations of static, equi uh, of static equilibrium, we have a name for that. We say that that system is statically determinant, okay? And that's what static determinacy means. If you have a system where you can solve for the, the unknowns using only statics, that's a statically determinant system. So it is, if, there are, uh, if there's a problem where we have more unknowns than we have uh, equations of static equilibrium, then the system is indeterminate. And when you're analyzing indeterminate systems, you have to know more about the system in order to be able to solve it than just statics. You have to have additional information, okay? And spoiler alert, I'll tell you what that additional information is. You have to understand the relationship between how much load you apply to the system and how much it deforms, okay? And so basically you use that, that additional uh, information to solve for the reactions that keep the structure uh, deforming compact. That's, that's basically indeterminate analysis in a nutshell, okay? So if there's more unknowns, then it's indeterminate. If there are less unknowns than equations of equilibrium, then the system is unstable, okay? Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, most of the structures that we analyze this semester will be determinate. We do determinate analysis first, and we'll probably spend about 10 weeks on that, and then the remainder of the time will be focused on indeterminate. Uh, analysis. Okay, now the way that we express that the, and the way that we can com, uh, uh, determine the degree of indeterminacy is with this equation here and that's the same equation I had written up here on the board. I call this the, uh, the degree of external indeterminacy, okay, and the reason we call it external indeterminacy is because when we're looking at this term, we're only looking at the structure as a whole and, and the reactions. This is the indeterminacy related to the, the external forces that keep the structure in equilibrium. Later on, we'll develop additional expressions for what about the internal indeterminacy? What about if we're looking at trusses or beams or frames or whatnot? There'll be additional equations. But for now, this is just external indeterminacy of the structure as a whole. Now, now if, if you want to know where this is coming from, Basically, what we've got is we, we look at this, um, this uh, equation. It's R minus the quantity E sub C plus 3, okay? R is the total number of unknowns. Remember a previous couple slides, I had the list of unknowns and then the list of knowns. The R stands for the total number of unknowns in the system. And so if I'm looking externally, I'm looking at the reactions. How many unknown reactions uh, uh, define uh, equilibrium for the structure. And so that's, uh, I call that R. And so it's the unknowns minus the knowns. And so the knowns would be, uh, I have E sub C plus three. Why three? Well, three is because there's three equations of equilibrium. Some of forces in the X direction, some of forces in the Y direction, uh, and some of moments. And the E sub C is basically for any, uh, we call E sub C, E sub C stands for equations of condition but it's really just a fancy term for any of the internal releases. So if I have a structure that has three hinges in it, then E sub C is three. If it has 12 hinges in it, then E sub C is 12. So uh, since we're gonna be using hinges as internal releases for most of the semester, you can think of E sub C as just how many hinges are in the system. Now, if I sub E is negative, the structure is unstable, okay? If I sub E is zero, then that would mean you had the same number of unknowns that you do knowns. And in that case, it should be statically determinate. And if I sub E is bigger than zero, then it should be statically indeterminate. Now the key word, the key thing to focus on here is this term should be, okay? Uh, just because I sub E is zero or positive doesn't mean it, it is a uh, 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 determinant in terms of what I'm talking about is this concept of stability because right now this degree of uh, indeterminacy tells us whether or not a structure is determinate or indeterminate we haven't talked about whether or not a structure is stable or unstable and so what's the deal with stability okay um, but before we do that let's just show you how how simple this is and then we'll, we'll talk about stability so let's look at, at, at a couple of examples so let's take the top one, 
Okay, the top one, I have a beam that has a roller on each end. Uh, the, each roller, here, let me use my pointer here. Here's my pointer here. So this is a beam, it ha it's, uh, has a roller on each end. So remember, rollers have one um, reaction on each end. So this has two reactions. R is two, E sub C is zero. So do the math and you get an I value of negative one. And anytime I is negative, that structure is unstable, okay? What about the one uh, down here? This one down here, we have a hinge that has two reactions, a roller, one reaction, hinge, uh, sorry, uh, hinge roller, that's three reactions, E sub C is zero, I is zero. I'll go ahead and tell you this structure is stable and it's statically determinate. Uh, finally, if we look at the one on the bottom, it has a fixed end here so that it has three reactions, one here, one here, that's five reactions. E sub C is zero, so I is two. This structure is stable and it's statically indeterminate. And whenever I is positive, we usually report the number. So if I is two, we'd say it's indeterminate to the second degree. Uh, if I is 23, we would say it's indeterminate to the 23rd degree. So we always report the degree uh, of indeterminacy. The higher that degree of indeterminacy, the harder the problem is to solve, the more complex the, the analysis is. Is everybody with me so far on how to compute this? It should be, be pretty straightforward, but has anybody got any questions? We, we can go through it. We haven't yet talked about the stability part in detail though. All right, let's talk about stability. Okay, so I've got this formula that will tell me whether or not a structure is determinate or indeterminate. Uh, and I can, you know, that, that's pretty straightforward, um, but it doesn't tell me whether or not a structure is stable, okay? And there are plenty of structures where if you just blindly do the math and, cu and calculate an I value, and we've actually got some examples coming up, uh, you can do the math and, and you know, get a, a non-negative value of I, but it doesn't guarantee that the structure is stable, okay? For a structure to be stable, you have to meet three conditions, okay? So first off, you have to have a non-negative value of I. So if I is negative, it is unstable, like just right off the bat. If you have a negative I value, it's unstable. Um, but you also have to satisfy two other conditions. The reactions can't be concurrent and the reactions can't be parallel, like all the reactions, I mean. So take a look at the image on the, uh, let's take a look at this image here on the top right, or uh, this one right here. So I have this structure here and if you compute the I value for this structure, like if you just do the math, you're gonna get an I value of one, okay? And so you're gonna look at that one and you're gonna say, oh, it's stable, it's indeterminate to the first degree. But none of that matters because this structure is unstable. And the easiest way of thinking about that is just look at it and ask yourself, isn't that a skateboard? Like, isn't it just a, a, a beam on a bunch of wheels? As soon as I take a force and I apply that force laterally, that structure is just gonna move. It's not gonna be restrained. It's just gonna freely translate uh, along the X direction. So, and, and the reason why, you know, specifically is because all of the reactions are parallel. We have these vertical reactions going upwards and because they're all parallel, the system does not provide restraint against forces this way. So as soon as you apply force uh, left or right, it's just going to go, okay? And so that's why that system is unstable. What about the system here on the bottom, okay? Well, if I look at this system, I cannot move that structure left or right because it's restrained, okay? I cannot move that structure up or down because it's restrained, okay? But what I can do to that system is rotate it, okay? Basically, th this uh, uh, system that you see here on the bottom is kind of like a fidget spinner. So if I have a fidget spinner in my hand and I'm holding it, like I can prevent it from moving up and down and left and right, but it'll easily spin because the fidget spinner cannot resist moments, okay? So the system on the top can't resist lateral forces, the system on the bottom can't resist moments. And the reason why, you know, mathematically, is because the system on the bottom, all the reactions are concurrent. All the reactions all meet at a common point. And when all the reactions meet at a common point, they cannot resist moments, okay? Does that make sense?
All right. Lastly, I, I want to talk about the equations of condition. La we haven't talked about that yet, so let's talk about equations of condition. Uh, whenever you include a hinge, uh, that ups your EC value by one. So if I look at the, uh, the structure on the top, the structure on the top has five reactions and no internal hinges. So it would be indeterminate to the second degree. As we move down, you can see that hinges have been inserted. So if I look at that structure in the middle, the structure in the middle has a hinge right in that center span. So the R value is five, but the E sub C value is one. So that structure is indeterminate, but it's only indeterminate to the first degree because when we put a hinge in, we gave ourselves another tool in the toolkit. We know that the internal moments at that hinge are zero. So that gives us a, a, another tool to assess. Finally, if we look at the one on the bottom, we have five reactions, but we have five known equations. We have our three equations of equilibrium and our two equations of condition for each of those hinges. So the one on the bottom is, is statically determinate. All right. Any questions? All right, now it's time to call on you all in the class. So, oh, oh no, that, that was uh, email. All right, I wanna talk, uh, I wanna start to get you all involved in the class a little bit. So we got a few examples, okay? Um, I wanna, uh, we're gonna take them one at a time and I'm gonna start asking you all to, to help me out with this, okay? Um, let's start off with example one, okay? I want somebody in the class and it can be in the chat or using your microphone, that's fine. We're going to take this example one. I want you to tell me, let's start off with the R value, okay? What is the R value for this uh, expression? And maybe I'll break my pen out here. Let's see if this works. Let me move my keyboard here. Four. Four is correct. So here's our, um, here's our equation. So it's I. Oh, it doesn't like my pen. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just do it through the chat. I have my notebook up here as well if we need it. So let's let's take that. So R is 4. R is 4. That's correct. What is E sub C? 1. Okay. So I had 1 and I had 0. Okay. For this problem, the answer would be 0 because there's no hinges inside the, the members that uh and and you've accounted you sort of if you were to say one i think you're probably talking about that one on the end but you're kind of double counting it because you counted the reactions uh as well so that's a that's a, 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 a an easy uh, uh thing to trip up on yeah the the e sub c for this one's going to be zero so uh if r is four and e sub c is zero what's ie what's the uh, i sub e term one exactly right so now here so we have an i one uh the question to ask is are the reactions all concurrent or parallel and the answer is no um let me, let me go ahead and pull i'm gonna pull my notebook up let me um let me stop my share here we're gonna share application Here, entire screen. All right, can everybody see my notebook here? Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have one, two, three. Four. And so if you look at those reactions, the reactions are not concurrent or parallel. So what we can say is this is stable and statically indeterminate. And it's the first degree. We say it's the first degree of indeterminacy because uh, uh, I is one. And so let me go ahead and put my formula up here. So it's I sub E is R minus E sub C plus three. Okay. All right. So let's look at the second one. Um, how many, um, how many reactions are we going to have on, uh, on this problem? What's our R value for problem two? Six. It's exactly right. Cause we've got one, 
two, three, four, five, six. And then I'm look, I can look at the structure and see that they don't all meet at a common point. They're not all concurrent and they're not all parallel. So that's not going to be an issue. So R is six. What about E sub C? Three. There you go. So if R is six and E sub C is three. What's I E? Zero. And so if it's zero and they're not all uh, concurrent or parallel, what we would say about this one is it's stable and statically determinate. Okay. So that, hopefully you're finding this is really straightforward. It's not a very uh, difficult thing to assess. Let me uh, let me drag these uh, let me drag these down a little bit. Okay, let's look at this one right here. Uh, somebody tell me what's going on with this one right here. This uh, this third one, this beam. There, here I'll move this one out of the way a little bit more. Well, I'll tell you what, what's my R value? Three. All right. Um, e sub C? Zero. Zero. But here, here's the thing. So, so first off, if, if I go through and do the math, what's IE going to be? zero but is the structure stable and statically determinate what's the deal no nah, because no. all the reactions are parallel exactly right all the reactions are parallel so because all the reactions are parallel this is unstable and so whenever a structure is unstable it doesn't matter what the i value is or what the degree is it's just unstable we don't care whether it's indeterminate to the sixth degree or or determinate we don't care it's just it's just unstable okay so whenever you see an instability just report unstable and, and move on does everybody else see that everybody else good with that all right finally let's look at our last structure and th these are the same ones that are on the uh, slides as well that were uploaded um, what's our r value going to be for this one Six. There you go. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So R is six and E sub C is. There you go. Pretty simple. So therefore, I sub E is what? There you go. And so because they all don't, they're all not all concurrent, they're not all parallel, this is stable and statically indeterminate. To the first degree. That's it. But before I open it up to questions, I want to say one thing. So I'm doing this problem right now on the OneNote uh, file. If you go to Teams and go to the class notebook, you should be able to access everything I'm writing down right now. It's in what's called the content library. And I think I'm going to do the problems like this throughout the semester. I'm going to add a page each day so that we have all our notes on a new page. So everything I do on the board will be on the page. And what, and what you'll find is, Today was very slide heavy and very lecture heavy, but in this class, you're going to find as we start progressing through the semester, we might have a day that has one slide and we spend the whole day on just doing the problem. And so the content library will become pretty, uh, pretty uh, critical. Um, 
I will, uh, I'll probably post something to show you all how to access it just to make sure that everybody's uh, comfortable with that. Uh, and, I, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait, to, I wanted to wait to do it after class because you should see all of uh, these notes that we've written together today. Um, before I close it off, any questions? Is the library a li library? Are you talking about the notes, the class notes? Yeah, it, it should be live. There shouldn't, it, there actually shouldn't need to be an, uh, an uh, upload. In fact, it should be there now. I want to pull something up real quick though before we, um, before we call it for today. So, I know you all probably have class coming up here soon, so I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so, this is the homework assignment. Uh, it should become uh, visible on Blackboard at 11. Um, basically, all the homework assignment is is just more of those classification problems. So, if you can look at those structures and identify whether or not they are unstable, stable and determinate or stable and indeterminate to whatever degree, that's it. And there's five of them. So uh, again, that should take more, no more, you know, five or 10 minutes to complete. So if you complete that, scan it and upload it to Blackboard by Friday at 10, you're good. And, and I'm not saying all the homework assignments throughout the, the semester are going to be this short, but the idea is that they're not going to be long. They should, they're, they're very uh, digestible assignments and something you can handle uh, in, in a short amount of time. Uh, any questions before we close it for today? All right, well, uh, next time what we're gonna do is we're gonna dive right into some actual analysis. We're gonna start with reactions and take it one step at a time. Uh, that's all I have for everybody. Um, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and we'll see you next time.